Hello, I'm Dr. Ashok Tansari and I am a cognitive neuropsychologist at Goldsmiths University of London. In this lecture today, I'm going to be telling you about why it is that a lot of young people, adolescents, experience anxiety, depression and other mental health disorders and not because of anything that they've done wrong themselves but because of the way society functions and also, strangely, because of the way that the brain is set up. I'm going to do this in a couple of parts. First of all, I'm going to tell you about a guy from ancient Greece who said something important. Then secondly, I'm going to tell you about how society is set up and why it is that there are certain aspects of society today that make it more likely that a young person is going to experience mental health problems. The third thing is that I'm going to tell you about the brain and what it is about the makeup of the brain and the wonky setup that actually makes it more difficult for young people. And then finally, because of this wonky nature of the brain, which combined with the issues within society, making it more difficult, I'm going to suggest some ways that young people can overcome these challenges that everyone faces. Okay, so first of all, there was a, a Greek uh, thinker and doctor called Hippocrates, who was, he's known as the father of modern medicine. And Hippocrates was very important because he made a very famous statement in which he effectively said that the root of everything that we feel as human beings, whether it's happiness, sadness, joy, sleeplessness, desire, etc., was in the brain. So in my brain, in Frank's brain, and in your brain. Now, the reason that that was important was that before then, thinkers, philosophers, etc., felt that everything started from the heart and that the heart was made as who we are. And the heart is important for pumping blood around the body, etc. But Hippocrates was the first person to suggest that actually who we are comes from up here rather than in here. So we've got to accept that some of what happens with us in terms of the way we feel, etc., comes from the brain. That then takes us to the second issue. And the second issue is psychology, human behavior and society. So a really important thing about us being a social species is that we compare ourselves to other people. So Frank compares himself to the other figurines that I've got on um, my bookshelf there, because it's natural. We compare ourselves to other people. I compare myself to other people. I've got an identical twin. I compare myself to him. We all do that. And that's part of being a social species. We're always looking around us. And in colloquial terms, that's known as keeping up with the Joneses, the people next doors. Now, when I was growing up in the late 70s and early 80s, the only people I could compare myself with were the people at school and the people in my local neighborhood. Now you, through the wonders of technology, you're able to see me because of this amazing thing called the World Wide Web, the internet. Now what that's allowed is that rather than just comparing yourself with um, the people at school and the people in your neighborhood, you can compare yourself with someone in Los Angeles, in Washington, in Rome, Tokyo, Sydney, Timbuktu, etc. Now, the reason that that's important for what we're talking about is that we tend to compare up, not down. Generally speaking, we look at the people who've got something more than what we've got and that we desire. And there's nothing wrong with that because that's what aspiration is. We want to be better. But unfortunately, that can have consequences. If we're constantly trying to compare ourselves to someone who's better looking, taller, has got better clothes, etc., etc., unless we have a handle on that and understand what that's about, it's very easy to feel inferior. And that inferiority is effectively the beginning points of things like depression, anxiety, and other mental health disorders. So we don't tend to compare down, we can tend to compare up, which for, in terms of aspiration is okay, but in terms of our mental health could be not so good. So I think that one of the difficulties that 
you as adolescents have is that you've got many more opportunities to compare yourselves against people who've got more than you and therefore end up feeling a bit negative about yourselves. Now, as a result of that, some of you might have read of a book called um, The Growing Pains of Adrian Mole. Fantastic book, which I would really recommend. And it's about a teenager and about his difficulties growing up as an adolescent and how it's not so easy. So the first thing to take away from this is that if you're an adolescent and you're finding some things a bit tricky, you're not alone. Most of us did, and most of the people around you are as well. So that's the first thing. You're not alone, there's nothing wrong with you. It is happening to you. Okay, so that takes me to the third thing, which is to do with the brain. Now, the reason that that's important is that the brain is set up in a particular way, and this is through evolution. Because of the way evolution worked, we've effectively got three brains. The oldest part of the brain, which is deepest in the middle, that is known as the reptilian brain, and it's the one that just allows us to survive. So it's the one that looks around, makes sure that there's no danger and keeps us alive. On top of that grew what's known as the mammalian brain. And the mammalian brain is important for emotional things and the things that we as mammals and other intelligent creatures have developed to allow us to look after our babies, etc. And this is where the bonds between individuals in different species, etc. come from the emotional centers of the brain. Finally, on top of that, we've got the thinking brain or the cognitive brain. It's known as the neocortex, meaning the new brain. So we've got three sections, the oldest brain, the reptilian brain, the middle one, which is the mammalian brain, which has got emotions. And finally, we've got the thinking brain on the outside. Now, the reason that that's important for what we're talking about is that as an adolescent, the first part of the brain, the reptilian brain, that's ready really early in, in life. The second part, the emotional brain, that's ready around puberty. So by the time you got into secondary school, high school, your emotions have already started. And you know that because it was a bit weird when you went into secondary school, the hormones started, you started having feelings, some of them you didn't understand. And that's the start of puberty with this huge emotional um, thing happening because of hormones going through your brain, etc. Now, to begin with, you can't understand those. So there are those growing pains that uh, Adrian Mull talked about. The final bit of the brain, the thinking brain on the front, in the front, that's the one that helps us make sense of the world and says, oh, this means that, don't worry about that, oh, I'm going to go for that, oh, I shouldn't do that. That is the control centre of the brain. It's the one that manages our everyday behaviour. And guess what? Unfortunately, that part of the brain is not fully functional until our mid-twenties. So we've got this discrepancy between your emotional centers already ready at puberty, 10, 11, 12. It's going crazy with all these hormones, feelings, growth spurts, etc. And you're looking at the people around you. Are they growing faster than you? Are they becoming an adult faster than you, etc. Then we've got the front of the brain that's lagging behind by at least 10 years in terms of um, helping us make sense of everything. So what we have is this discrepancy between the emotions, which can make us feel a bit icky and uh, and the front of the brain, which says, don't worry about it, it's going to be okay. So we have this mismatch and that is why adolescence can be a really tricky period because that's where if you start developing mental health problems, it can be difficult to deal with. It's a really difficult period for substance use and substance abuse. All sorts of behavioural problems can start up in adolescence and if they're not checked, then they can really go haywire. The impact of head injuries or any brain damage during adolescence is much worse than later on in life. So as a result of that, adolescence is actually a, a tricky period to get through. So congratulations for making your way through it part of the way or all of the way. So finally, given this wonky setup of the brain, what can we do about it? 
Okay, there's a number of different things that you can do to help here because it's all about brain health and brain efficiency and helping you feel connected to other people. So the first thing is better diet because although diet is generally for our physical body, diet is also good for our brain. If you eat certain types of food, that's better for what your brain needs because your brain is made up of, of different types of cells and those cells might need something different from your other muscles. So there are cer certain foods um, in, uh, with fatty oils, such as in fish, um, fresh vegetables, nuts, and things like that, that are directly going to make your brain more healthy. And if it's more healthy, it will process things more quickly, better, more efficiently, and therefore help you deal with some of these issues. The second thing is physical activity. Again, whilst physical activity is good for the rest of the body, it's also good for here because it helps flush out toxins and allows the brain to function in a more efficient way. So those two things that we usually think of as for physical health, food, exercise, they're also going to be good for up here. The third thing that's important is sleep. We know that sleep isn't just for rest. Sleep is for general housekeeping of the brain, for flushing out any um, toxins or waste products, and also for improving the way we lay down memories and for helping our uh, cognitive systems, thinking process, become more efficient. So having about seven and a half to eight hours of sleep a day is really important. And studies have shown that adolescents who have too little sleep or too much sleep, they're more at risk of mental health problems and they're more at risk of substance abuse problems. So getting good sleep is really protective for your mental health, which will then have other impacts on your life. The fourth thing is mindfulness meditation. And that com comes from my um, uh, cultural background from India, from Hindu and Buddhist teachings. We know that mindfulness meditation which isn't about chanting or wearing saffron robes or anything like that, but about concentrating on the current moment, we know that that is really good for the way the front of the brain processes information. There are a lot of research studies that have demonstrated the positive impact on the way the front of the brain manages behavior by mindfulness. And it's even used by the National Health Service in the UK to help people who are suffering from depression, particularly people who've suffered more than two bouts of depression. So it's been used across the different mental health issues for helping and protecting people. So I would really recommend something called the eight week course of mindfulness because that's really useful. So don't go for any meditation, go for the eight week course. And if you have questions, then do send them in and I'll happily answer those questions. The final thing is a fun one. It's been found that singing in choirs is actually really good for your mental health. Now, the reason is probably complex, but part of it is to do with your fact that you're breathing a lot because when you are um, singing properly, you have to breathe properly. The second thing is that in fact, singing is a form of mindfulness. When you're singing, you can't be paying attention to that or doing something else. You have to concentrate on the thing you're doing. And what that does is it stops you thinking about that icky thing over there, that worrying thing over there, etc. Singing is really important and helpful for that. And I think the third reason that singing is good is because it's about bring, bringing people together. And being with other people and singing in, in concert, in chorus, which means together, that is really protective and helps us feel part of a bigger thing. So those four things, or five things rather, better diet, physical activity, sleep, mindfulness meditation, and singing in a choir could be really helpful. So overall, the message is that it's not your fault if you're suffering from mental health problems or you're finding things challenging. It's just the way that the brain is set up and because of the way society is set up. There are ways that you can address this and help yourself by doing those things that I talked about, the mindfulness, the eating better, sleeping better, 
and possibly joining a choir and those will really help you avoid some of these problems. I hope you found this helpful. Please uh, like this video, make any comments that you'd like, encourage other friends to listen and watch these videos and subscribe. We will be creating more videos and we're always on the lookout for more ideas for different things to do. So please feel free to let us know what you think and I look forward to giving you the next lecture.